about cryogenic hemp. What is hemp? A uh, high electron mobility transistor. Okay, so we'll discuss this. But before that, let's take a look uh, that is role in quantum computer. So I, I shown this picture to you before in lecture two. This is from quantum machines, right? They use this to, they have a full stack of solution with the software and hardware to control the qubit, right? So they send out some analog signal and go with some mixer to bring it to high frequency. We will talk about mixer later also a little bit. And then uh, you can control the qubit or read the qubit. When you read the qubit, then the signal will go to here. First, you go through something called tuple or a quantum limiter amplifier. This is a uh, traveling wave parametric amplifier. So you add the least noise to this amplifier. Again, we later with this study why you need this one uh, when we learn the noise figure. After that, you do another amplification. The amplification that, uh, uh, of tuple usually is small. The goal is to amplify it, but then at the same time, uh, add very few noise. Those noise are just quantum limiter that we cannot eliminate. Then you go to the HAM, which is the high electron mobility transistor. And usually it operates at about uh, 4 Kelvin to 77 Kelvin. Right, so here shows another diagram I usually draw, right? Uh, so here again is the quantum machines. You have the signal, go through the mixer, bring it to very high frequency. Go through attenuator. Do you know why we need to attenuate the signal? Any idea? Look at the temperature, maybe you have some idea. Because at room temperature, we have a lot of thermal noise. Remember what is the scale of the thermal noise? What's the energy? Yeah, uh, what is the equation? K? Yeah, KT, right? Or KT over Q, right? So your equipment, right, are all at room temperature. So the signal has a lot of thermal noise. So that's why we have a lot of attenuation for it. But at the same time, we make the uh, signal very strong so that when you attenuate all the way to this 10 mini Kelvin, uh, this thermal noise uh, not important. They are less than the quantum noise, for example. Right? Attenuator just make the signal smaller. So Opposite of amplifier. Uh, exactly, yeah. Uh, so it does not have a, the noise that is larger than the quantum signal. Yeah. Then you go through here again, this is a tuple. Right, and then you have isolator. Isolator is to avoid the signal from here going back. Do not think that this is one direction though, right? If microwave, uh, everything can go to any direction, right? Even it is small, but the noise from the room temperature to here can destroy all your stuff. So you have isolator. And then again here we have the hemp, increase the signal by 40 dB. And we will go through this math in the future when we talk about LNA, right? Uh, so hemp uh, is very important. Uh, for a few reasons, it has low noise, and other it has a high, uh, high gain due to high speed. Okay. So here are some examples that I know people use in their quantum computer. Maybe I can show a knowledge, right? So I work with Lawrence Livermore Lab, and they actually purchased some of something related to this to build their quantum computer, uh, which is uh, this part, right? So uh, you see that something we will discuss later, noise, temperature, right? So effectively, how much, every amplifier, uh, you amplify the signal, but unfortunately, at the same time, you add the noise to it. Just like the uh, energy, you, you, you in, uh, have some gain or something, you always have loss in energy, right? You, you're always not ideal. So, but here you say the noise temperature is 1.5 Kelvin. What does it mean? It means the noise, right, added by the amplifier is the in the order of KT, which is K times 1.5. Okay, so it's, as it, it's nothing that we are putting this in uh, under, uh, 1.5 Kelvin, right? It's just that at the operating condition that we apply here, 
Uh, it add the noise as if it add the thermal noise of 1.5 Kelvin. Uh, this is a very good figure. For example, this is 54 Kelvin. If you put it really in the stage like right here, then you know it's a big problem because it's not 4 Kelvin or below. And you are having an amplifier that is generate 54 Kelvin of the noise, right? Equivalent noise. So the lower noise temperature, uh, the better the, the amplifier in terms of noise. Okay? So, uh, so, so you, look, you can look at the size and just get a feeling what they look like. It's pretty bulky. So it's no longer an integrated circuit, right, in this, in, in this sense. Okay? And, yeah. So this is Yeah, it's amplifier. Yeah, SMA. Yeah, you're right. Well, I saw, just saw SMA somewhere. Yeah, here. RF connector, female SMA, right? And then, of course, you need to have male... Uh, what do you call cable adapter, right? To connect. Yeah. Ah, uh, what is SMA? I forgot. Let's Google. That's 10-4. Yeah, I should use chat GPT here. Yeah. Is that right? Wow, then I really didn't know that. I didn't have this, I never, <laughs> don't have this impression. Okay, you can Google more. Yeah, but it's true. Uh, this one is uh, very small and then uh, depend on the connector. So by the way, we can talk a little bit. You see the, here, this one has some uh, Dielectric platform, right? Yeah, and some of them is air, so that so they they, they, they they have different operating frequency, and the price is very different. But now I suddenly forgot this one is cheaper, right? With the platform, right? If it is air, it's much more expensive. But you can go to high frequency, forty gigahertz. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Yeah, because it's more difficult to build. You don't have a support, I guess. I think the reason is. Finer, smaller conductors. Right. Yeah. So, you need, yeah, very delicate, right? Because you don't have support. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. So this one, you can maybe only 10 gigahertz or something, right? But that one, you can go to 40 gigahertz or something. Okay. Good. Okay, so what is HEM? And I forgot to delete the note. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? Say again? Yes, it is. It is. It is recording. Yeah. Okay, so what is HEM? I forgot to delete my notes from last year, uh, two years ago actually. HEM, High Electron Mobility Transistor. I already mentioned that, right? So let's take a look at its structure. It's not the same as the transistor we have talking about. So what, 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 what does a transistor cross-section look like, which it, I call it MOTS, right? Metal, this is not equal to metal, oxide, semiconductor, right? MOSFET. Right, most fat, few effect transistor, right? So what does it look like? You have a gate, maybe this is metal, and then you have oxide, insulator, and then you have silicon, right? A typical one. And you have source and drain, right? Are you okay with this? This is what we have been learning, right? But I'm saying that no, it is not equals to this. Let's look at its structure. It usually is formed by, uh, and it is all called, also called modulation to field effect transistor, heterojunction field effect transistor. You will understand very soon why they are called causal. Usually, we are going, we use, uh, for the MOSFET, we usually use group, this is group four, okay? Uh, four valence band, carbon, actually we don't use carbon, but actually we do for diamond. We have diamond transistor for power electronics. 
Silicon, germanium, tin, you don't use it because it is a uh, metal, right? But still some people try to explore but, uh, it, but let's ignore this one. For this ham, usually we use the alloy or, or compound, right? From group three and group four. So this is in, grid, in this Roman letter, this is group three, this is group four, and this is group five, right? Instead of five, six, seven. Now, for, let, let's just look at example first. For example, you will use aluminum, gallium, arsenic alloy on top of gallium arsenic, right? So let's start with gallium arsenic. What, what does it mean? This has a free valence electron. This has five valence electron. So you mix them together, the, the effect will be similar to the four valence electron. So you form a neutral crystal, right? Of course, you still have some, what do you call, ionic bond. It's not really purely covalent or the covalent bond is called shifter, right? You have some delta charge, you have dipole, right? But this is a crystal. Another thing I want to say is, and we just discussed earlier, when you go down, what happened to the atomic size? Atomic size or the distance, atomic distance, right, or the lattice size increase. But what happened to the band gap when it goes down, do you know? It is smaller, reduced. A little bit difficult to say, but uh, you just do the calculation, right? Uh, they're further away. And if you think of it as some quantum well, if it is wider, the separation between the level will be smaller. So the band gap is actually the separation, right? Maybe I may be wrong. That's how I think about it. That right? But that is an effect of that. But always remember, larger atom, smaller band gap. Diamond has about 6.3 EV or 6 EV. Silicon dropped to 1.12. Germanium 0.67, and tin, no bank gap, metal, right? Similar for here, boron. Uh, boron by itself is not, but boron nitride is also an ultra wide bank gap device, material. Uh, actually, many people study it. So they both have small atom, and again in the order of 6 EV, okay? And then gallium arsenide is uh, another. Uh, but uh, it has a certain band gap, but I forgot it's 2 EV or something, okay? I think it's a little bit larger than silicon. I, I thought I can be wrong, right? But it has the band gap, okay? Idiom antimony. Now, so you see that I can mix, mix and match, right? Now you go to save way. Group three and group four, you get the same thing. You can mix and match, right? But the point is here. If a gallium arsenide has a certain band gap, what happened to aluminum gallium, gallium arsenide? This aluminum and gallium are both uh, group three. So they are substituting each other, right? You can think of aluminum gallium arsenide is having some arsenide, gallium substituted by um, aluminum. So overall, should I have a larger or smaller band gap? First of all, what is the lattice size of, for this one when I substitute with aluminum? Smaller. Yeah. So smaller lattice size. So the band gap you said is larger, right? You just come back to what we said earlier for the fin fat. We use silicon carbide, remember? Then we have a smaller lattice, then we cause some tens uh, tensile stress for animals. Silicon germanium, we have a larger lattice, we cause per compressive stress for PMOS. This is the same, okay? So if you go over this carefully, you will find that all this has a larger band gap. And those on the right has a smaller band gap. Right, for example, I look at this again. Yes, you give me indium gallium arsenide. I compare this to here. This is indium aluminum arsenide. The difference is I replace gallium by aluminum. So again, I replace gallium by aluminum, by a smaller atom. 
So this one, again, have a larger band gap on the left and smaller band gap on the right. Yeah. So are they don't. Yeah, for the reason we're going to explain. Let's look at its operation because we don't have this thing for silicon. Now, then, so what is a hemp? The same as a MOSFET, except that we also have a gate. But here, we actually put a wide band gap material instead of oxide. We put it everywhere. Is that okay? Wide band gap material. Here, aluminum, gallium, arsenide. They have wider band gap. And then below, we put a small band gap. We have the space, and let's ignore it now, which is gallium arsenide. Okay, so a wide band gap on top, smaller band gap at the bottom. But the, the main point here is that the smaller band gap is undoped. You don't have any doping. Okay, yeah. So the spacer is this one. Yeah, which is still a gallium gap arsenide, but we grow it without doping. Okay, this is for a reason I would discuss earlier. And the next result is that even I don't have doping below, I have attracted a lot of electron in this layer, which is called two-dimension electron gas, 2DEG, 2 that. Okay, now, do you see any doping in this layer based on its drawing? This layer, I form a lot of electrons to that. Do the electrons see any doping, any impurity? It is not. It's, yeah, even the spacer is undoped, right? You said in the interface that is also correct? No, you don't see any doping, right? Do you have Coulomb scattering? No, because there's no doping, right? It's pure gallium arsenide everywhere, right? So that's why you don't have Coulomb scattering. Now, how about surface roughness? It is small because this is a crystal. We go it, grow it epitaxially. So it doesn't have the rough surface, nice like silicon dioxide and silicon. So it may have a little bit surface roughness, but very small. So what doping, what scattering does it have? Just Mostly just phonon. And that's why you have high electron mobility. Okay? Now, we have not talked about the details, but go back to your question. Can we have silicon hem, right? Then now the question is, yes, I can put silicon as the bottom layer, can you find an epitaxial layer that has a, a larger band gap on top of silicon and at the same time it grows uh, epitaxially crystal, right? With a very perfect interface. Carbon. Very difficult because the lattice constant difference is very large. And by the way, I, why I can do this? Because I can mix and match again and not just the type also the percentage. I can change here, I did not write down the whole formula. It can be aluminum 0 0.2, gallium 0 0.8, arsenide. Means 80% are gallium, are, are, are gallium and 20% are aluminum. So by changing the composition, I can change their lattice constant, at the same time change their band gap. So they can match those at the bottom. So this material used a lot in photonics, right? So anyway, the point is that it's difficult, but of course you can think of, how oh, about I mix silicon as the top layer and then germanium as the bottom. Silicon germanium, is that I can do that? That's right. But however, silicon itself is not a wide band gap. Now let's go back to here. Your gates want to have enough uh, isolation to the substrate. You cannot just use a narrow band gap material. Otherwise, it becomes just a conductor. The, we are replacing the oxide here by this 
what we call barrier. Eventually, I should call this name. This is called barrier, just because it has a larger band gap. Okay, so this is just an overview. I will go to the details. Any questions? Is that clear? So what's the function of I will talk about that later. But, but we can discuss now. If I spacer is heavily doped, what happened to your electron? Will you feel any impurity? Yes, it will, right? Why isn't that? It's confined at the interface, like what he said. Yeah, but you said the speed is no, I'm asking you, undoped, then you, you, you don't feel impurity. If now spacer is, if we don't have spacer, that means that this part is also heavily doped. Yes. Would the electron in this two dimension electron gas feel the impurity? Why? Isn't that it confined in the quantum well? I mean, in the, uh, isn't that it's confined at the interface? Why I will feel the impurity? It's just like, isn't that I'm just pressed against the wall? Why I will feel those holes inside the wall? But you're still full of impurities from those. So even if you're not touching them, you're nearby them, so you're going to feel some Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you can say that because of feeling, but uh, the electron actually have a pretty large uh, screening effect. But what I'm trying to fish for is, this is a quantum mechanical electron. Your wave function actually penetrate into the wall. So you are going to have the interaction, not just because the electric field coming out. Yeah, the electric field coming out, you are right. But, but yeah, you may got screened by the 2D gas, yeah. Do you have the undone space? In that area, right? Yeah. Then we need to go to band diagram. Now, so here we show the band diagram. So what is this? What are we drawing here? This is line eight. So what are you drawing here? So I have this. Now I try to simplify. You have the aluminum, gallium, arsenide, which is 1E18. And then you have a tiny spacer, which is undoped which is also aluminum, gallium, arsenide, and then at the bottom you have gallium, arsenide, which is also undoped, right? They're very pure. Now, if I try to draw a band diagram by cutting here to here, A, A dash, and that is what I get, A, A dash. Is that okay? This is the, Barrier. Now you understand why it is barrier. This just look like the oxide, except the oxide is nine point. It's a nine point one eV. This one may be four eV or three point something eV. I don't know. Right? Yeah. It's kind of like MOSFET. It's kind of like MOSFET. Actually. It's just a wide band gap material. Wider band gap, band gap material. It's not oxide. It has a wider band gap. So you put it together, it's just what you get. Yeah. About 9.1 EV. No, no, no. What I thought is silicon dioxide is about 9.1 EV. This one is, I don't know, maybe 4 EV, 3 EV in that order. Of course, yeah, because different material has different band gap, right? Of course, there. I just told you, uh, carbon has uh, six point three or six point two eV, right? It's just different material has different band gap, and turn out that aluminum gallium oxide has this band gap. As I said, I forgot it's above two point something. Yeah. Then gallium arsenide, then then get right. But why it does not give me? It yeah, one point four actually. I am wrong. One point four, right? It's pretty small. Are larger than silicon, 1.12, 1 
right? So this is 1.4. Yeah, question? That depends. Depends on all the configuration. I'm going to talk about uh, threshold voltage, right? But, but the point is that now you understand why it is called barrier. Because here I have more aluminum, I have larger band gap. And this is the channel, right? And this is under zero bias. Let's take it for granted. You have this band bending. Now let me ask you, why do I want to top this guy? Because this guy will provide, but this is under the gate, right? This, what I'm cutting is under the gate. What I'm cutting is the gate. And I need to emphasize that, look at this. The gate is not everywhere. You also have this region which does not have the gate. Now, if you do not form any electron here, then it will be disconnected. You don't have any current. This is the so-called excess region for the hand. Is that okay? Sorry. What? Look at this. Only this region is under the gate. Correct? The gates can help me to induce electron. But how about those regions outside the gate? How do you get this electron? You cannot control it, right? You need to naturally form the electron when you have the, when, when it is formed. Then that's why you can think of this. This is not a band diagram, but if this is heavily doped, and naturally electron will go to the right hand side because this, is, this has a lower energy, right? Just due to this, everything go from high energy to low energy. That's why this is called modulation dope field effect transistor. Okay, so you are actually doped by, you, you, you get an electron from another layer. It's not from, I, I do not get the electron by putting dopant in this gallium arsenide layer. I get an electron because the wall next to me will supply electron to me. It has a lot of electron and I'm at a lower potential. Like the water will always flow to my place and then form the river. Okay, yeah. No, electron come from the barrier. Do you see the pointer here? This is the barrier. Yeah, you will go to here. Yeah, you, you can think of here I have a lot of electron. When you put the two junction together, isn't the electron will go to the other part just because of the thermodynamic equilibrium? You will go from high concentration to low concentration. And at the same time, this is also at a lower energy in the band diagram, right? Because this is very higher, this is lower, then I will also Accumulated electron. It just uh, it, just think about water. It's not difficult to uh, think, right? If I have a duct here, and then I have a lower place. If I fill this one with water, isn't that the water will spill to here? That's it. Yeah. And that is why you cannot do this in silicon if you're silicon dioxide. Your silicon dioxide cannot provide a lot of electron. It is insulator, right? This, I can dope it because they are crystal. They have well-defined uh, trap, I mean, uh, dopant, but silicon, you cannot, you cannot dope silicon dioxide to N type or P type, right? So just like you freeze all the water, of course you cannot provide to silicon. That's why you don't have the hem for silicon in this sense. You cannot use silicon dioxide as the barrier, right? So that's one thing. And why this is called heterostructure, heterojunction fat, hetero fat. That is because I have a two different material. It means hetero, that is the definition. Uh, that is another name for hem. Okay, so uh, based on this now, this is a zero bias. Then I'm going to, but if I add the correct metal gate at a zero bias or I go to negative bias, do you have electron here? Based on this band diagram, do you have electrons? No, why? Because what? No, I mean in this figure, do you have electron? 
When I could show, uh, show here, I mean this location. Do you have electron? Just look at band diagram. Why? Okay, well, closer, you need to use Fermi level. So, so tell me. Good. So he said the Fermi level is far away from the conduction band. So you don't get electron just because of Fermi Dirac statistic. Remember? The Fermi Dirac statistics tells us that F of E equals to 1 over E to the power. I hope I'm right. E F minus E, right? Divided by KT plus one yeah so if your fermi level is way above of the energy you are interested in i mean way below right then i'm wrong this is this should be negative yeah so it's e minus e fermi if your energy is way above of the fermi level then this is very large this term so this is very small you you got, don't got occupation right so here you don't have electron Right, so you, you that's normal, right? If I keep pushing this uh, gate voltage up, which means more negative, then I repel the electron. Okay, then what is the trestle voltage that you just asked me? The trestle voltage will be such that I start applying negative bias to the gate. When I apply negative bias to the gate, isn't that this will start bending just like what we had in the MOSFET? Apply negative bias, right? Uh, sorry, positive bias. I say the wrong thing. Positive bias. Then you will go down, right? I keep confusing it because this is the energy of electron. Band diagrams is energy of electron. I apply positive bias, then the energy of electron will go lower, right? Because an electron is negative charge, right? Or think in another way. If you have a positive bias, everything, all the electrons want to go here uh, thermodynamically, right? From potential point of view. So this must have a lower energy. Right, all the water will flow to here. And I get this band bending. Eventually, this one will touch the Fermi level. Make sense? Yeah. Should the barrier also bend? Very good. It should also bend, it should change. But however, if you solve the equation, the bending is not as much as this one. It just turned out because this is uh, uh, heavily doped. So uh, it won't uh, bend as much, but you see that it does change some. And also because this is thin, yeah, it should bend, but not bend all the way here. Also depends on the uh, material and the operation condition. It should bend so it's less like this. It should, like, it, it does show that this one go up, right? Do you see that? Yeah, it bend, but not as much. If you have bent a lot, then that can be a, I don't know if that would be a problem, but yeah. So that's why you can use TCAS simulation. Any one of you want to try the project HAM for low temperature, you can try. Is that bends a lot? Oh, I guess. It should be okay. Yeah, you, you find you bend a lot, yeah. But, but yeah, it should bend, but not, but it, yeah, but that's a good point. So you need to watch out for that. So here again, right? So what is the difference between oxide and wide band gap material? They're the same. They are just a barrier, okay? Except that the real, the oxide actually is amorphous in our case, right? It only has it has an effective band gap, but this wide band gap material, we can say, well, they are just a crystal. But their effect in the transistor is the same. And because it's amorphous, so that's why we cannot dope it. We cannot rely on the oxide to supply the charge. But the charge is not for the area under the gates, it's for the area outside of the gate, the SS region. So how much do we need a band? We need a band so you touch it, right? So this is the trestle voltage. It is the barrier height. This is the Q5BN. This one, you cannot change it because it depends on the material, right? If there's no something called Fermi level pinning, basically, this is what you have. 
And then in order to bend it, then of course, I will subtract the band bending of this region and then band bending of this region. Then that is the difference that I need to bend it. So that's why you ask, uh, should this barrier also bend? Uh, it will, but not much if you solve the equation. So then we assume that all of the bending, when you apply the gate bias, uh, will occur here. So you need to apply enough so that you can bend this region by this much from this point to this point. Is that okay? And this point to this point is just this barrier minus the potential drop across uh, the barrier and then minus the difference in the conduction band, Vp, uh, delta Vc. So that is the threshold voltage approximately. Yeah. Yeah. Fermi level, okay. Uh, the, the way I, this is just copy and paste and somehow when I paste it, I put it in the same level. It does change, but just look at the relative, you should look at the relative position. EFM to EF here, right? Here they are on the same level, but here they are different level. They do change. But this is just, I put in different scale. You, you cannot compare this to this. It changed, right? It is much lower than the EF here, right? Here is the same. Yeah. You can say where it was uh, just because potential really is relative. You need to find a reference point. And we usually just put the subject as it is. If you want, you can just uh, fix it. Uh, if this is completely correct, I fix the metal and then just move this up. It's completely okay. This is relative, right? So, which one is physically correct? Just the no. Line? It's, uh, no, again, relative. You put zero, one volt at the gate and zero volt at the substrate. It's the same as saying that I put negative one volt at the substrate, zero volt at the gate. Only potential difference matters, right? Of course, now if you have sauce and drink, then you need to fix that also. So you need to decide which one is zero. So it really doesn't matter what I'm drawing is, I mean, what I'm pasting is still correct, but it's all up to you. But the main point is you see the difference. This is zero and this is lower. Yeah, good point. So the, the contacts, the, the sauce and drink contacts, are those going through the, the 2D layer? Yeah, this is a very uh, complicated question. Actually, uh, it does. So you need to have the contact. In a real case, you actually may etch it all the way down. Uh, for some uh, the DY, for some like gallium light chart, they actually rely on vacancy to have the doping. So the modeling, yeah, but ideally, you need to have a good contact all the way to the 2D EG. They only add to the EGs a very few resistance through this content. Yeah, so that is a challenging part. So if you come up with a new ham system and you cannot form a good source string content, then it's again useless, right? So if you read the paper, uh, source string content and how you can make them uh, an important part in that paper to show that what they promote uh, 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 works. So that is a very good point, right? So in, again, in silicon, what do we do? We already have uh, M plus, very good contact, right? So directly taking it, but here is not the case. Sometimes you either you use doping here, they use M plus doping. So in this case, probably they can do it very well. In some system, you edge all the way with the metal or create some damage. The goal is to have a very small resistance from the metal to the 2D EG, to that, okay? Good, very good question. Now, so this is the threshold voltage. If you understand, understand this good, you understand how I get this? If not, not a big deal. This is not a class about threshold voltage, right? But I hope that you can appreciate. But the most important thing is what? After it's turned on, how much 2DEG do I get under the gate? Again, under the gate. Is VG minus VT and minus the potential. So we talked about this earlier at different location of the transistor, you have different potential. And then as a result, you have different uh, charge, right? So now go back to uh, your question you asked earlier. This potential is kind of similar to the biasing. Uh, 
at different location, right? So you, you actually have a, a higher drain potential, higher uh, channel potential. Effectively, you have a lower substrate bias in that sense, more reverse. So that your effective VTH is larger in some sense. You can think in that way also, yeah. But anyway, we just used uh, what we learned before. You need to uh, subtract the potential and then go over VT, and then the rest will be the mobile electron. Yeah, question, sorry. Yeah. 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 So so here here asking right. What uh, in MOS we usually define it as like uh, it was a P type substrate right with a certain distance for the, for the uh, uh, Fermi level and now it, we invert it right. So we have two five to define the threshold to the uh, inversion. Uh, here we don't do that because your substrate is not dope. And now, and that is just a definition, really not important, right? If you follow the definition, that will be okay. So in this particular book, like C and D, you should get a copy. Uh, Simon C, you know, know him? Have you heard about him? He was the guru of uh, device physics, Simon C. Uh, he he went he went back to Taiwan to teach, and uh, but but he recently passed away. He's a guru, and uh, his book right the C's book L later uh, people he at his newer edition have more people, but the the orange one the the the, the red one or orange one was very famous. Every device physics people will take a look. The one I just showed you just now is his book Simon C. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's a Bible. Uh, yeah, so when you touch, it's just like Razavi or <laughs> in uh, analog, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay, then how about the capacitance? How do we find it? The capacitance, again, is the epsilon divided by the thickness, right? But here I want to introduce a few concepts. First, of course, you have the D1. What is D1? There is the thickness of the barrier. Top barrier. That's okay. How about D0? Spacer. Spacer, very good. So that is done, right? But you still have one more term, delta D. What is delta D? If you amplify this part, this is a very confined triangular area. So you only have confined state. E0, E1, E2, just like a quantum well, but it's a triangular quantum well, okay? Now, because it's a quantum object, then I have the wave function like this. Okay, now obviously, E0, the wave function on E0 does not touch the wall, right? Does not touch the interface. It has a... This is interface. It touched the interface, but not all the wave function touch the interface, right? So it does have the centroid, right? So if you take the whole electron, a group of electron into account, not all the electron, electron has a zero distance to the interface. On FH, they have a distance of, exactly, delta D. Ah, the drawing, if you don't watch the video, you don't know what I'm talking about. You see, you have a delta D, right? So effectively, we have a delta D here. So you think that you're so thin, right? But actually, your effective capacitance is lower because it is thicker. This is not only happened to 2 DEG, it happened to highly scaled transistor also. That is called quantum confinement effect. So you do a gate oxide with EOT, right? Equivalent oxide thickness of one nanometer. But because of the centroid of the electron and hole, you're actually getting 1.1 or 1.2 nanometer, which is 10%, 20% worse than what you want. Yeah. 
Yes, you can use that to measure. But here I only assume this delta T is at E, e zero, right? If you want to go through the full computation, it's just solve Schrodinger equation. And that it also depends on the population. You have more at the bottom, right? Those high state are not populated. So that would be an average. Eventually get a centroid. Okay. Exactly, expectation value. Something like that. Yeah. So very cool. Although I spent a lot of time on this, but we make this clear, right? So now you understand the system. Then we can just go to the equation. Turn out the equation is the same as what you learned before. I copied the equation from that book. The Z here, maybe his name is Z. That's why he was Z. It's the width of the transistor, like what we did earlier. Okay. So current is what? Uh, I should say this. This is the linear mode. It's the same. R equal to W on L mu C ox, and then VG minus VT times VD minus VD squared over 2. This one we covered already. If you forgot that fair, fair enough, you just go back to compare, you see they're the same. Just the label are different. Z now called W. CI, we got, don't call it C ox because it is not oxide. It's just the insulator. They call it CI. I mean, insulating or barrier. Yeah. Uh, and then this is the saturation mode. When you go to saturation, the same, W on L, mu C os divided by 2, Vg minus Vt squared, exactly the same. And here we just substitute C, Ci, the capacitance, by epsilon S divided by this whole term. Now, there are lots of approximation, by the way. We say that the thickness is D1 plus D0 plus delta D, but the dielectric constant are not the same, actually. D1 and D0 are aluminum gallium arsenide. They have different dielectric constant than the substrate, which is gallium arsenide. Okay, so again, it's just an approximation. Okay, you can make, if you want to make it even more uh, closer, then you need to just make it as a series capacitor. Each has its own dielectric constant divided by the thickness. Yeah. But you use the as kind of like an amp. E of S is a FH. Yeah, you, you can say that. Yeah, you can say you can find a FH value for it. That is also okay, but not purely FH, right? Because the thickness are different. Now, same thing. We will run into velocity saturation. And remember, in velocity saturation in our MOSFET, it was the width, right? Again, Z is width, width times the saturation velocity times the uh, carrier density, right? So here we just copy Q times NS is just CI times VG minus VT. Now, if you remember, we actually minus V set also with some adjustment, but that is okay. This is just uh, a toy model, right? Uh, we get, get a feeling whether you minus a V set or not, not that important. And what is GM? What is GM again? Partial ID, again, this is, I say it's the saturation current, right? But after all, it's just IDS, right? So GM is partial ID, partial VG. Turn out it's independent of the gate length and gate voltage. When you go to velocity saturation, you make it smaller, it's not helping. Right, here just to remind you, when it's not at velocity saturation, what type of curve is this? ID VG or ID VD? IDVD. Yeah, you read here or have hope you remember the shape. When it is long channel, no velocity saturation, they go up square, right? 1, 4, 9, 16. But when you have velocity saturation, they go up linearly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I mean, for the current level. I'm not talking about the label for each VG minus VT because this is square, this is linear. Hope that you have this in your mind, right? So it's the same. Whatever we learned earlier are still correct. Okay. Then uh, I want to introduce. Yeah. Uh, I think we the yeah, so we did that for SOI. You remember we don't have also Coulomb scattering if it is undoped, it's very small, right? 
for untop one. If it's top, you still have large Coulomb scattering. So let's say here, fin fed or... Yeah, fin fed, again, very small. But remember, the main point is that your fin fed interface has a lot of defect because it's interface with the interfacial oxide and also half lamp dioxide. So all this, you can feel it, but we don't call it Coulomb. We call it remote Coulomb scattering. We did not discuss this. We have so-called remote Coulomb scattering, remote full-on scatter, uh, remote Coulomb scattering, and then 2D surface full-on scattering. They're, actually, they're more complicated than this. There are many different scattering mechanisms people realized when they did that. And then even the metal kit can help you to screen some of the scattering. You need to take that into account. So it's not as simple as this. Here is just a simple picture. Okay, so I cannot review, just say now I give you a table, but mm -hmm. that is not the case, not that simple. But you will say, yeah, the bulk Coulomb, Coulomb scattering is zero for fin fat. Right. Surface roughness is smaller, we discussed that already, because you push the carrier more to the body. Yeah, remember we have the fin fair free, free side wall, right. but you still have uh, surface roughness. Yeah, it will be larger than this one, because this one is crystal, that is not. Okay. okay so I'll turn back. No, uh, what, what matrix, uh, what are you comparing? I, I would say you don't try to come up with a simple conclusion. Fin fat is better, ham is worse. Because first, uh, they are at different dimension. Uh, your ham cannot be as small as fin fat. Because this is a 2D, 2D transistor. Yeah, you cannot go too small. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> no, 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 you just cannot short channel effect, right? If you're too small, you just cannot turn it off. Typical when you are very small, they're talking about 40 nanometer or something, right? You cannot get 10, nano, 10 nanometer. If you try to do that, they do something TK, many different engineering to bring up the stuff and then you introduce other problems. It's just different because this is one gate. Fin fair and nano shear is four gates, right? You cannot get the same uh, control. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that be very careful, try to draw conclusion. Because you cannot just say, because of this, I want you to use this technology for Qubit. Uh, it really depends on what is important for you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, again, the main point is we did not discuss some very important scattering. Thin layer mobility, remote Coulomb, remote Folon, and then plus metal gate screening. They can help you to screen some of the scattering uh, that due, due to some quantum mechanical chip. Okay.